<sighs> Hello guys, welcome back to Grand Prix World, where last time out we had a fantastic performance, actually. Um, coming in much, much higher than uh, we anticipated, although of course it was quite uh, a high level of attrition during that race. This episode is kind of a bonus episode. It's coming out earlier than I predicted, simply because I found myself with a bit of time. It's also balls hot outside. Um, we're not even at midday yet. It's already 32 centigrade. I have no idea what that is in Fahrenheit. Um, and we're looking at 37, possibly 38 degrees. I'm not built for that sort of temperature. So with that in mind, we're going to go over some of the uh, decisions that we have to make going forward. And uh, some people have asked me to go over in a bit more detail what the impact of our decisions would actually be. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at the news and open a cold one. And... We're going to get through this together. Let's just take a look at the news after the last round in Brazil. So obviously Michael Schumacher won, which we know. Uh, Mr. Cowlinshaw has signed for Jordan, which means he's no longer going to be negotiating with us. Bit of a pisser, but I think there's another five-star chief mechanic that we can actually try and pick up. What else has happened? Both Jordans finished in the top six. Uh, what? I'm sorry, <laughs> some stuff just fell over on my desk. I don't know what happened there. Um, okay, so as you can see, there was heavy rainfall during the qualification session, which we already know about. Um, it also affected the race, so no news for us there. Um, apparently, our cars were too slow. The drivers um, are not particularly happy with our power deficit. There is a power deficit. I don't think there's um, any denying that, really. But I don't feel in the wet weather it affected us too badly. And, of course, you know, we are going to do what we can do to um, get ourselves out of that situation. Um, Heinz Harold Frensen has signed for Ferrari. And it seems to be a direct swap with Michael Schumacher, who has signed for Williams. So that should be interesting. That'll shake things up next season. Oh, we've lost Mikasalo. Damn it. So, obviously, as I mentioned in the last episode, part of what um, this episode was going to be about and what the next episodes were going to be about was making the decision whether to keep Mikasalo or not. Um, weirdly, I took a look at the stats off camera, and for some reason, I've never noticed it before, in all the years I've played this game, Mikasalo is actually, on paper, a poorer driver than Pedro Diniz. I have no idea why this is. Because Mikasalo was a very, very capable driver in his day. Um, I was actually a big fan of his in the 90s. So that's unfortunate, but we will go over what other um, possibilities we have. Obviously, here there's the uh, article covering the pit stop fire that Davy Coulthard had that took him out of the race. Um, I have to say, that's actually the first time I've seen that reason um, appear for not finishing a race. So that was very interesting. Um, the only, I think he's the only five-star commercial manager has signed for Benetton. Um, not too jealous about that, as we've been over before. His commission level is going to be huge. I, I don't think it's actually going to do them any favours, um, budget-wise, at least. Um, Adrian Newey is going to Ferrari. That's fine, we weren't interested in him. Uh, Stefano Domenicali has um, extended his contract uh, is in charge of the commercial team at Ferrari. McLaren have signed Rory Byrne. So all the big names are being picked up quite quick. And Nigel Stetney is on his way to McLaren as well. So as you can see, all the big names have actually been grabbed up really, really quickly, which it can happen. Um, I've certainly seen it happen before. But what tends to happen more often is you'll see these kind of signings coming up maybe four or five rounds in as teams sort of try and make the uh, the people in question sweat a little bit and maybe reduce their wage demands as the season progresses. What else is going on? Williams have already signed a sponsor, so that's very, very good. Um, they must have put some fair resources into that, or maybe they already had uh, some kind of good relationship there. Jordan have signed John Alacy. Um, which I believe was a real move. I don't think it happened in 1998 for 99. I think it may, it might have done, actually. Oh, well, art imitating reality, I suppose. Uh, 
We've lost John Barnard to Jordan, but that's fine. We didn't want to spend two million on his sal uh, on his salary. It, it is unfortunate, I suppose, that we couldn't retain him. He is one of my favourite designers, but um, not really much we could do. Uh, we finally have the uh, regulations for next season shared with us by the FIA, so that's really good. Um, sports journalists have voted Alan Prost as the uh, worst manager of the month. Likewise, presumably the same number of journalists have voted Luca Di Montezemolo as uh, manager of the month. So congrats to him, or the virtual equivalent of him. What may not have escaped your attention is this up here. This is excellent. I have no idea where this is coming from, so we're going to take a look at our budget really quick. So it looks to me, actually, that we are receiving a higher percentage of our sponsorship money than I'm used to seeing um, during an Arrows playthrough. I have no idea why that is. Obviously, there's there are variable elements running behind the scenes, and there is, a, I suppose, there's an element of... Um, at least in the first season, it feels like there's almost a, a, a random element. It's very small variance, but you will tend to see things shaken up a bit to keep things fresh. It really does help the game um, have a long lifespan, actually. But that is fantastic news for us. Um, we don't really want to spend too much of that, as we went through last time. It's going to cost us about one and a half million to um, build our cars at the end of the season, so we need to keep that sort of money in the bank, plus a bit extra to cover our operation costs. Um, but we are moving in the right direction. Let's take a sip of this icy brew. Ah, textbook. So, first of all, we're going to go through um, the alternatives to, to Mikasala, which now is, is definitely uh, of interest to us. First things first, though, we'll take a look at the stats. So, what you can see is um, Pedro Diniz actually has more skill points than Mikasalo, which is very arguable <laughs> in real life. Emmanuel Collard, with his ridiculous hair, has ones across the board apart from morale. Now, morale is kind of important. It's more important with your department heads, but it does. it's kind of like a performance multiplier, and if guys have got full morale, then you're going to get the absolute best out of them, and the way to keep the morale high is to deliver good results on track, which... You can end up in a uh, a bit of a spiral, actually, playing as a midfield team. If if you get very unlucky and you lose a team sponsor between, say, 99 and 2000, and suddenly you come into 2000 with a budget $20 million lighter than you had in 1999, <clears throat> that's inevitably going to affect your ability to develop the car. And your performance can decrease, which then decreases the performance of all your department heads and your drivers and you end up with this spiral where you know you can't sign sponsors because your commercial director has terrible morale and isn't performing at his best and because he's not signing sponsors you can't improve the performance on track with the resultant money which means your drivers become demoralized and it's a very difficult thing to control uh, what's best to do I find is when you know you're going to develop morale problems if you can avoid signing long-term contracts with drivers at least, then that's definitely the route you should take. That wasn't an option for us because we need the Deniz dollars. They are very important. Um, however, I'm, I'm not too concerned. Two morale isn't great, but I've got a feeling 1999 should deliver some level of improvement for us, so that'll be cool. We're still going to have a John Barnard designed car next year. Um, he is a four-star designer. I think, to be honest, we're going to see provided that we deploy him to the best of our ability while his morale is relatively high, we're going to see a good design come out next year. Anyway, moving on. So, <clears throat> what you can see um, around the mid-table here is their ability in wet weather, which for some reason I thought was higher with Mikasala, but it isn't, and their concentration. Um, in particular, concentration is important from the, the standpoint of making errors. The higher a driver's concentration and skill, um, the more you can push them. So on the other screen where we decide how aggressive our drivers can be, this is the kind of score that, in tandem with how good your car is, um, decides basically if your drivers are going to have an accident. 
this is, I think, a really good demonstration of why this game is so fantastic. And it's part of why no game that's come after has ever been as good. Um, again, as we went through in episode one, a lot of people feel that the EA sports um, management games of the early 2000s were were better. I think they were graphically superior, you can't really argue that, but it was a very superficial level of, of simulation where if you wanted a sponsor, you would wait until they were available, then you would click on them and submit an offer. And the criteria between whether or not they would sponsor your team simply came down to, do you already have a sponsor in that sphere? So, for example, if you already had a sponsor from the world of petroleum, let's say you were Sauber and you had Petronas as a as a sponsor, if you then try and sign a deal with Petrobras, they would say no. But the only reason they would say no was because the, you already had a petroleum sponsor. Um, and they didn't want to compete for car space or advertise on the same car as a car that's advertising a, a rival brand, which obviously makes sense. Um, but hopefully that analogy kind of displays to you how superficial the level of simulation is. It's so um, it's so shallow that I don't feel any reward um, from achieving a, a contract. It's the same across the board. So the same works really for um, signing a deal with an engine supplier. There are no works or partner deals in that game. They don't exist, so you, you always are paying customer, which doesn't reflect reality at that time at all. Um, and so there's the tactical element is almost sort of lost. All you've got to do to increase your budget really is be quick on the draw and try and pick up the big money sponsors as soon as they become available. And I don't know, maybe I'm playing it wrong. Maybe someone out there knows how that game works uh, to a level that I've never been able to interpret, but it feels to me a very hollow experience. It's it's undoubtedly um, prettier than Grand Prix World, but it's nowhere near as good. Um, the reason uh, as well, I suppose, is this game takes into consideration stuff such as personal relationships, so you know you can have something akin to uh, the Ross Braun Michael Schumacher relationship develop, which means it makes both parties easier to sign provided you already have one signed and you can develop this kind of synergy and you know having a, a synergy between a car designer and a driver can be a fantastic thing because you know you're going to have um, a, a very healthy symbiosis between the driver and the car simply through the understanding that the designer and the driver have, have developed of each other um, no game I believe since this has has gone into this kind of level of detail and they're all poorer for it. I, in my opinion, there is no excuse that almost 20 years after this game, no one out there has been able to produce uh, a simulation of this level. Um, the great thing about it is, aside from being a very complex simulation, it's very, very accessible. Um, I don't feel it's overwhelming. There are some details that you do have to look up in the manual, which I'm going to go through when we're looking at the engines in particular. But hopefully this is um, expanding on what we discussed in the first episode, and it's kind of helping you understand the game, and for future episodes it might help understand why I'm making the decisions I'm making. So anyway, we've, we've digressed uh, far enough. Let's take a look at the possibilities. So what we can see is we had Mika Salo for 1.92 million a season. I'm not going to count bonuses for this because there is absolutely no chance in season one or season two of us having to pay these bonuses out. We can promise the world, um, very much like the Liberal Democrats. Um, now we could sign Emmanuel Collard for a mere 40,000. We could promote him to a race seat. But again, this would be this would have to be a long-term investment. What we'd be saying is we are prepared to undergo two, three seasons of very poor performance from him to enable him to develop. And while you might think that um, having him serve as a test driver for a few more seasons would boost his stats, it actually doesn't. That's probably my biggest gripe with this game. I don't have many, but my biggest complaint is putting guys out for testing does not improve their ability. 
at least uh, not as far as I've noticed. Um, there is a chance that he could organically improve going into next season. Um, I've never seen it happen, but I believe it's possible. So you could find next season he's got an extra point somewhere. But an extra point isn't enough. Um, we don't have the money to spend on top-level drivers, but likewise we are not so desperate as to need to hire drivers who are completely useless, which he would be initially. The main guy I would look at to replace Salo in terms of a, a, a driver who isn't a pay driver would be Alexander Vort. As you can see here, he has a number of benefits. First of all, he's a lot younger. Mika Salo will almost definitely retire <clears throat> at some point in the next 10 seasons. Salo also tends to be the driver that you see retire most frequently and earlier in the game. Almost every game I've played, Salo will retire between the ages of 31 and 34. It's not fixed. He can go on to, to 40. But what you've got to remember as well is that this is a different era of Formula 1. You didn't get 19, 18-year-old drivers. It just didn't happen. And Alex Vogt was considered very, very young and inexperienced when he stepped up to Formula 1 at 24 years old. Most drivers came into the sport in their mid to late 20s and stayed until the mid 30s. Um, if you look at, let's say, this is just after Damon Hill's career peaked, and he's already 37, and he didn't retire in 1998. I think he went until he was 39 years old, which, when you look at today's grid, seems age ancient, but it really wasn't such a big deal in those days. Um, so when you're looking at Alex Wurtz, what you've got is a driver who would, provided he continues to perform, you could sign him again and again and again, and naturally his pay would go up but he would consistently develop. He can also get worse, and certainly as a driver reaches a certain age, they will begin to regress. But at 24, he hasn't peaked. Um, I think you're going to get another two, three years of solid growth out of him, potentially. Again, his ability to develop depends on how well you perform on track. If we, by some miracle, developed a championship-winning car next season, and he was signed to us, the morale would go up, which would increase his performance, which would also increase his growth. So like you can have a downward spiral, you can also have sort of a meteoric rise if the conditions just become right. And some people have said that kind of bothers them. But if you look at Formula One historically, that is exactly the sort of thing that can happen. It, it, it's not fantasy. <clears throat> In fact, when you look at the, uh, the website of the, the gentleman who developed this game, uh, Edward Grabowski. Um, there is an element in either the manual or the, the Q and A or whatever, saying, you know, is the game unrealistic? You know, I seen um, Mika Hacken and San for Minardi. Um, what do you, what he says as an example is when he was testing this game, um, someone complained to him that Damon Hill had uh, signed for arrows in the game. And anyone who knows Formula One of the nineteen nineties will have will remember that this was, you know, this was a game in development for quite some time, I believe. Um, Damon Hill did actually move to Arrows in in real life, because sometimes the conditions are just right for that sort of move. And he'd been dropped by Williams. He had no top seat open to him, so he was left with a choice between a year out of the sport or a year with a midfield team. And like most drivers, he chose to stay in Formula 1 with a midfield team in the hope of getting back into a top seat. And that's the sort of thing you see here. You know, I don't think... If Nico Rosberg lost his race seat and there was no other competitive seat available on the grid, I don't think it's at all impossible that he would accept an offer from someone like uh, Mana Marussia. It, it's not it's not unfeasible at all. To him, it will be a short term deal. To them, it's it's a sort of a coup. You know, they're they're achieving something that they wouldn't otherwise achieve. They're getting access to all this experience, and yes, they're going to have to pay for it. But what development he could do in that time would be absolutely vast for them. He's going to get knowledge. They're going to get knowledge through him of the teams he's worked for in the past, how they do things, how they operate. It's going to improve their operations. 
these kind of moves do happen. Um, and when they do, they seem like this big seismic shift, but both in real life and in the game, you'll find that actually when you dig into the reason behind it, it's actually a perfectly reasonable move to make. So my gut would be, based on all this information, that Alex Futz would be the guy to go to. He's a guy that's not going to have a problem signing for a midfield team. He's a guy that's quite young. He's already very capable. His wage demands are much lower than Salo's. And we could probably get him for less or the same as we're currently paying Salo. And that would represent a massive step forward for us, I believe. Or at least potential step forward. Um, alternatively, one of the few test drivers with some extra skill is Luca Badoa. Um, Luca is 27, so you're not going to get the same length out of him potentially. His pay is much lower. Um, he's... He's worth considering if you ever find yourself at a, a, a loose end for a season and you don't want to take um, any of the non-F1 drivers, which is a perfectly reasonable thing to feel. Um, like whenever a real team takes a non-F1 driver from a lower formula or allows a driver to make a, a side step, um, it is a risk. It's invariably a risk because Formula 1 is a very specific kind of race formula. Damon Hill is far too expensive for us. Likewise, Ralph Schumacher, we could maybe, if we get lucky in the sponsorship front, afford to, to hire him. He is only 22. Um, his skills are fairly average. He was a fairly average driver, in my opinion. Um, controversial opinion, but opinion nonetheless. Um, he's not really all that interesting to me, to be honest. Um, I don't think his performances really transfer very, very well. And he, while he does have a, a decent speed and skill level, and his overtaking skill is, is far superior to Mikasalo's, his concentration is too low, which again is, is very similar to real life. If you remember um, or you look back at Ralph Schumacher's career at Jordan and, and his early Williams years, he would bin it pretty frequently. Um, he was not a guy who was shy about going off the track into a wall. It, it just it happened to him more than I think he would care to admit. Mika Hakkinen, one of the best drivers on the grid, um, as really he was. Only 29, so not exactly a spring chicken, but likewise you're going to get a decent amount of time out of him, potentially, but obviously his wages will continue to rise, and starting at 7.2 million is a bit rich for our blood. Ricardo Zonta, 21 years old. Um, yeah, nothing's particularly spectacular. Um, his morale is excellent at the moment. I mean, that is variable, it can change. Um, <clears throat> but that is that kind of creates great conditions to develop him. The only thing that bothers me, I suppose, is um, that drivers like this, I feel, should come with sponsorship as they would in real life, to kind of incentivize you to, to take a risk on developing one of these drivers. I very rarely do it. I spend most of my time signing established drivers or pay drivers, who I suppose are drivers who come with sponsorship. Um, but what I mean is, signing him should come with a sponsor on the car, if that makes some sense. You know, when you sign Pedro Diniz, in real life he was backed by companies like Parmalat. But if I want Parmalat on my car and I want their sponsorship money, I have to sign them as part of a separate contract. It would be good for any future management game to have drivers that come with a, a sponsor and as sort of as an incentive to develop a driver when there are better drivers out there. Moving on, uh, Shinji Nakano, um, he wanted a four season deal. He is only 26. Um, <clears throat> his stats don't look very, very good, but he's a driver that I found in this game performs really, really well, actually. Um, his greatest strength is that he tends to develop really well on the skill front, and I've actually won a championship with Shinji Nakano. He's definitely worth a look, absolutely. Plus, he brings almost three million in, into the budget. Uh, unfortunately, he won't work with us at the moment, but he is definitely worth considering. Likewise, Esteban Tuero, he's a guy 19 years old, um, comes with 3.7 million in backing. Not great skills, but he's a driver who in almost every game I I play, 
on Grand Prix World, ends up having a pretty solid career. And very often I've actually seen him in a race-winning position at teams like Ferrari. Um, he does tend to develop really, really well. So maybe we won't sign him to begin with, but he's definitely someone that we'll keep an eye on. And I believe he stays as a pay driver almost the entire way through, if not the entire way through. So he's someone that we really want to keep an eye on over the coming two to three seasons. And maybe in the early 2000s, if he comes along as well as I believe he has the potential to, that's someone we could pick up and pick up the budget. So definitely worth keeping an eye on. Laurent Ridon, 24, nothing to write home about. Panis. Panis is very interesting. 2.8 million, uh, 2.08 million. Um, he's very, very, very capable. I don't think his stats here do him that much justice, except on the skill front. I do think he was a very skillful driver. Um, in 1997, he broke his leg, and his form kind of went off after that. Um, but that was more down to the way the Prost project panned out. He um, he just basically had a bad run of luck in how they developed the car. The car was an absolutely atrocious beast in 1998. But in 1997, Jacques Villeneuve, um, I believe, stated that he felt Panis was his biggest threat that season. Um, Panis also won the 1996 Monaco Grand Prix. He's a very, very capable driver, and there are much, much worse ways in this game to spend 2.08 million. Um, and also, I, you know, there's not really much to complain about with those stats. I believe you could win a championship with him fairly, fairly easily. Um, of course, you've got to deliver him the car to do that, but he's very experienced. He's still got another four or five seasons at least. Yeah, he's someone we could definitely consider. Stefan Sarazan. Again, we're not going to look at Sarazan until next season. His wage demands are very, very low. He's only 23, but we need Prost to develop him. What's very interesting is, I don't know if Trulli is injured or not, but he has been demoted out of the second race seat. Um, this is going to make him incredibly easy to sign if he's not injured. And Trulli is, like Tuero, one of the drivers who tends to go on to have some of the uh, the strongest performances down the road. I've won more championships with Jano Trulli than any other driver. 23, Italian, 1.4 million. Um, his speed needs some work, but again, that's something that can come up, as can his concentration. He was a very... Um, actually, all through his career, actually, he was a sort of driver who could put in an amazing one-lap performance in qualifying and then throw the race away. And that is something duplicated in his early seasons in Grand Prix World, in my experience. However, it still stands that I've won more championships with Jano Trulli than anybody else, so absolutely worth a look. Jean Alesi, excellent driver, very, very excellent driver, but unfortunately, getting on a bit. Um, it's debatable whether he can maintain the same level of performance, his concentration has already dropped. But you can't argue with that experience. Unfortunately, 6.4 million, too expensive for us. Moving on. Johnny Herbert, very much like like a Lacey, but less exciting. Um, 3.04 million a season is about half the cost of a Lacey um, for more than half the skill. So again, not necessarily a bad investment, but certainly a short-term investment. Still a bit too rich for our blood. Jörg Müller, German, 48,000 a season. Yeah, nothing exciting. Barrichello is a great investment. 25, so plenty of time to develop him. He was 25 once, I know it doesn't feel like it. Um, 4.1 million a season, probably going up to about 4.3 if we were to try and sign him. He's a driver who would conceivably sign for us. His greatest strength is that he very rarely bins it. And historically, that was the case as well. Plus, he's fast. He is a fast driver. He's someone that, if we had the money, would be up there. Definitely. I'd rather, I think, invest in him than almost any driver that we've spoken about thus far at this stage in the game. Later, I'd probably opt for Trulli or Verts, But um, he would definitely be... 
if you're looking to make a big game straight away and you know you're going to have the money on hand, you can go a lot worse than Barrichello, I feel. Likewise, Jan Magnussen, just, just no, just don't. There is no such thing as Ricardo Rossett, we're not talking about him. Um, Takagi. Takagi was actually a, a solid driver. I don't think these stats do him justice. He came into F1 with a lot of fanfare and he did amazingly well in the Tyrrell, actually. He got some performances out of that car that the car didn't really deserve. And I think the, the scouts who put together this data... Uh, by the way, all the driver data for the first season comes from numerous sources. Um, kind of football manager style, if you will. So, you know, people within the motorsport world gave their opinions and the game developers made the stats accordingly. Um, but Takagi is solid and he brings 6.4 million. Um, he's unfortunately wanting a bit more out of us than we're prepared to give him, but definitely worth considering. Andrea Montemini, 33. He's a bit old to sort of develop at this point. I couldn't really recommend him. His skill levels are too low, he's a bit too old. The less we talk about him, the better. Uh, John Newhouse, who's obviously supposed to be Jacques Villeneuve. Again, one of the best drivers out there. 26, so you're going to have a bit of time from him yet. Not very good in the wet. <sighs> what more can you say, really? I mean, I can't see why you would pick him over someone like Hakkinen, to be honest. Um, but yeah, that's, that's it. I mean, Hakkinen's cheaper and he's better. That's the end of the story, really. And then we've got Juan Pablo Montoya, who in this game is terrible, and I don't know why. Um, again, you can develop him, but he's only 22, so you're going to get a lot of chance to develop him. But I've never felt that investment pay off. I have tried to develop Montoya. It's never worked out for me. I don't know why. The remaining drivers are all non-F1 drivers, often very, very young Um you can get some great performance out of them, and occasionally the system will throw out one of these drivers with massive sponsorship. Um, so keep checking these because I think in 1999 you will find drivers bringing something in the region of 10 million a season, and it will be one of these non F1 drivers. So that's someone we'll come back and look at. But the only variance between them tends to be uh, their age. Um, Loretti here is actually developing quite nicely. Um, 24 though, he's at the older end of the spectrum for uh, the, the uh, unproven drivers, but he's the one, if I am going to develop a non-F1 driver, he's the one I tend to recommend unless one of the others brings the cash. The cashola is incredibly important and it's a big incentive for developing drivers. So what we're really here to look at and we're going to make all our big decisions in the qualifying episode that goes out on Wednesday. What we're really here to look at in a bit more detail is uh, the engines. Incidentally, by the way, Ford will not give us a works deal, which is a kick in the pants like you wouldn't believe. Um, we really needed a works deal, really. Um, so now that's got me thinking that actually we might look at Mugen Honda where we know we're going to get a partnership um, but yeah what I didn't show you previously and what I'm here to show you now is this button this here is a side-by-side -side comparison of the first spec of each engine for 1998 so these do develop but I believe what you see is the first engine they brought to that season and it's kind of a guideline for showing you what this sort of data produces. There's no guarantee. It could be, even with less research and development, Ferrari next year could produce a better engine. You can also have like Ford come out with an amazing engine. Um, it can happen, but it's a good guideline to look at what teams brought this season. And what you're looking at with engines is, this is sort of, um, I think it's kind of fuel efficiency, so how well it extracts power, but also, you know, how um, how friendly it is to fuel usage. This is heat. Obviously, the Peugeot there generates a lot of heat. Um, sorry, no, the Peugeot's got excellent cooling. That's what I meant to say. Um, again, the red end of the spectrum indicates a, a negative 
the green end of the spectrum is a positive. So both the Mercedes and the Ferrari don't handle heat as well as the Peugeot does, but likewise they deliver more on power. Leistung is power. Um, here we've got reliability, responsiveness, rigidity, and weight. If you ever find, and I'm a bit of a cheat here, I'm, you know, this is something that really I think is rewarding to find out for yourself when you try this game, but if you ever find that you're going through rear wings a lot, like your cars are dropping out with a, uh, a rear wing failure, this is the reason why. The engine is sending vibration through the stem of the rear wing and it's causing a failure. Um, it took me a long time to figure that out, but that is genuinely the reason. And again, it's a really good example of how um, in-depth the simulation is, that the game is simulating the vibration from the engine and its effect on the chassis. That's fantastic. It really is fantastic. Moving down, Mugen Honda, Ford, and down here, of course, you see which teams are using them this season. Mechachrome and Hart. Hart is um, really Arrow's engines. I believe they kept the Hart name in this game to stop you feeling the need to use your own brand engines. But at this point, Hart had been bought by Arrow's and the, the engine was called uh, the Arrow's V10. Um, and they did develop it themselves. So it's only Hart in name. Brian Hart engines were bought out in 97, I think, when... Um, arrows were getting ready to move away from, from Yamaha. So what we see is we're on par with Ford really in terms of power and reliability. To me those are, are actually the two most important elements. You want the power and you want the reliability and you want good weight actually. Um, instead what we've got is quite a weak engine that's very very responsive and the rigidity is fantastic um, for a first spec engine. Um, Mechachrome is essentially Renault. What you find is there are two engine manufacturers who can come into the sport at any time. Those are Renault and Toyota. Mechachrome is Renault, really. Um, it's a separate company, but they continue to produce engines that up until 97 had been Renault badged. Um, so you can end up with Renault and Mechachrome as options. Um, Renault will always be superior and I believe Mechachrome are just developing a older Renault design. So that's the difference there. For those of you in the know who know that Mechachrome basically were the company that made Renault sport engines, that's the reason why they can both appear in this game. Mechachrome is incredibly reliable, but the problem is you always pay for Mechachrome engines. I don't believe they offer partnerships. Um, Ford, not looking great. This is why you need the works contract with the ability to develop because your testing can then give you points to put into power and to reliability and then you're already starting with great stats elsewhere. I mean, that's why it's unfortunate that you can't get a works Mugen Honda, Honda deal. That's, that's actually my third gripe with the game. Mugen Honda did do works deals. I don't know why in this game you can't have a works Honda engine. But you should be able to. And I believe there is a mod out there that puts it in. There are plenty of mods. You can get a 2010 mod if you prefer something more modern. I, I've had so much trouble getting this game to work stably that I just haven't bothered, to be honest with you, with mods. Um, moving on, you get the same kind of stats with tyres. So you get um, the hard and soft compounds, the intermediate and the heavy rain. Um, you can get a third tyre manufacturer, which would be Michelin. Um, what you have here is grip, um, sort of how um, how long lasting the tyre is, and again, you've got a rigidity value. That's how stiff the sidewalls are. Uh, and then here is temperature. So how quickly they get up to temperature, how well they maintain temperature. Um, so what you see is the Goodyear hard compound is arguably the best tyre, actually, at least the first version of it. This doesn't count specific compounds developed for specific teams or upgrades that come throughout the season. Um, yeah, to be honest, Goodyear are producing better tyres. Um, we're currently running the Bridgestones, um, and what we found last race 
was that the softer tyre works better for our car anyway, but also statistically it's better except in um, in how long we can keep them on. So what we're going to be doing is no longer splitting our strategy. We'll definitely be taking the soft compound going forward. What this means though is that at the moment we're working towards re-signing with Bridgestone and Bridgestone could go on to produce a better tyre next season. It is possible. But it does make Goodyear look a lot more enticing than it was previously. Anyway, moving on. Fuel. Only two values for fuel. Um, that's the power value and uh, the motor tolerance. Basically, that affects the reliability of the engine. Um, if the uh, if the fuels and lubricants, because I mean it's not just the fuel deal; it's also the lubricants. Texaco, for example, has amazing power potential in their race fuels, but I guess the lubricants are no good at all. And if you have a poor uh, rigidity or a poor reliability value on your engine, this is going to exacerbate it. Whereas the Elf engine is the opposite. Not really much uh, Elf engine, sorry, Elf um, Elf products. They're lacking in power significantly. Only Total is kind of same ballpark, but it's incredibly kind to the engine. Um, I believe we are on Elf at the moment, actually. Let's take a look. Yes, we are. And yeah, we did indeed notice that we have a very significant power deficit, which doesn't help the power deficit we have on our engine. Um, these are the sorts of things we're going to be looking at in the next episode and in future episodes. And I hope this video has kind of helped explain the decision making process, what to consider, and kind of shown you a little bit how deep the simulation actually goes. Because when I'm just playing through, if I don't show you these things and explain the significance of certain details, you're not going to truly appreciate because outwardly the game doesn't look all that complicated but all these things are calculated in the background and just because the animation is really bad when a car has an engine failure and wiggles off the track doesn't mean it's a rudimentary or simple simulation that's going on. Thank you very much for joining me. We will have the decision making and qualifying episode on Wednesday I believe on the new schedule so race will be um, next Saturday or Sunday and uh, I will see you on Saturday as well, actually, for the F1 2015 launch video with Simon. Um, that's my final update, that a friend came through for me, and we've managed to um, source, for a very reasonable price, a, let's call it an interim system. I expect to get about a, a year out of it. It is a six-core system. It's going to have the graphical grunt to do a, um, a large amount of what we're going to want to do, but given that I want to look at Star Citizen in the future and be able to deliver you videos in you know excellent resolution, excellent graphical fidelity, in about 12 months time we are going to need to upgrade again, but the most important thing is it's not going to affect the 2015 Corp season with Simon. So good news there. Okay, so thanks again for joining me. Um, it's always a pleasure to describe how this game works. If you have any other questions, slam them below. Otherwise, I will see you for decision time and uh, qualifying for Argentina on Wednesday. Have a good one.